Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the seventh annual Dr. T.K. Ramayandra Memorial Lecture. And let's warmly welcome Dr. Menaga Guruswami. As you know, every year we conduct this event, Dr. T. K. Ramachandran Memorial Annual Lecture. It's a tribute to one of our friends who passed away in 2008, that's 15 years ago. And as a person and as a public intellectual, we had left an indelible mark on the lives of many, especially in the intellectual life of Kerala. So we thought, why not bring the best of the speakers available in India every year, once a year, of a humble effort to rekindle his thoughts and to rekindle the listener's thoughts also. You know, um, <clears throat> TK was a actively concerned with a particular slice of world history. That history was between the First World War and the Second World War. What happened between the First World War and the Second World War was a complete change of world history. It was following the Soviet Revolution. The conservatives have become, have toughened their stance after the horrible massacre of the Sarf family the entire European upper class was in a turmoil. This was exploited by a group of leaders who came up toward the late 30s and very active in the last, in the 40s. You will be recollecting their names, Mussolini, Hitler, Franco, the whole lot of what we presently call in the collective noun of fascists. So TK was very much concerned about this particular period of history. And this particular period of history has elicited a philosophical response from a group of European thinkers, mainly based in Frankfurt, Germany. Theodore Adorno and Wilhelm Rey were the important thinkers of that period. And in Italy, we had Gramsci. So, but also from Germany itself, the Walter Benjamin. So, Tigre introduced their thoughts in, I mean, he died in 2008. So, his active period, intellectually active period was during the 90s. So at that time, there were no wisp, there were no portents of such things could happen in India. So he was, the people generally tried to be dismissive of him. Um, some called him scaremongering. But actually, he was foreseeing a lot of things. And so his thoughts in this, at this juncture of Indian history, at what we are going through, his thoughts have great relevance. And who <coughs> could 
better express it than Dr. Menega Gurdiswami. I am personally a great fan of hers because, as all of you know, we all become a great fan of hers because of the live feed of the Supreme Court proceedings. So, we have circulated um, her extensive biography, so I'm not repeating it. So, her topic will be what, what is keeping us alive, the Constitution of India, and I won't stand in your way between Dr. Menega Guruswami and the lecture. Thank you. first thank the organizers um, for inviting me, uh, for having me, for hosting me, and for giving me a chance to have this conversation um, with all of you. Um, I have been to Kerala uh, at many significant points in my life. The first time I came here was as a law student uh, to the Kerala Law Academy's moot court competition. Um, so if, you're, if anyone here is, knows that, then you know that it's a wonderful moot court competition, but it was my first experience of coming to God's own country. Uh, uh, the second time I came to Kerala was uh, as a lawyer uh, and as a great fan of the Kochi Binali. Uh, and I told one of the organizers that what is different about Kerala is that when you go to an art installation or an exhibition or a storytelling of any kind, it was the first place where I saw lots and lots of school children coming and engaging the exhibits. Again, a reason why it's God's own country, because this is how young people are being educated. Now, today is a momentous occasion for me because it is yet another significant time in my life. It is the first time that I'm going to give a public lecture having reading glasses. Um, you know, so I come back to Kerala, of course, uh, not just now as a lawyer, but, you know, as a middle-aged citizen, um, as a parent, um, as a citizen who sees what you are seeing and feels what you are feeling about what is happening in this country. Now, what has been the enduring reason for my optimism about India and my optimism that freedom will only expand and those who compress it, these are momentary things, is this wonderful book that has been my favorite book um, from the time I was a teenager to now and a book that gives meaning to everything I do, the Constitution of India. And so I hope over the next 45 minutes to an hour, we will have this conversation. I know that many of you are standing at the back. There are a few chairs here. Uh, so please come to the front. The chairman of the drafting committee of India's constitution, Dr. Ambedkar, spent a great part of his childhood trying to move from the back of the room to the front of the room. So especially to women here in the audience, please come to the front of the room. <coughs> Take your seat at the table always. And there's one here, and there's a, there's a couple more. So since this lecture is in honor of Dr. Ramachandran, and Mr. Madhavan has given you some introduction to him, uh, the one thing I found very interesting when I was reading about Dr. Ramachandran is that he did his PhD on the work, the poetry, and the aesthetics of the poetry of William Blake, the English poet. Now, I found that interesting because I had only very briefly read Blake. So I thought I owed it to Dr. Ramachandran, who I'd never met, to read some Blake. And I found a poem of Blake, and I want to start this lecture with that poem, because I think 
it captures quite well, even though it was written hundreds of years ago in a totally different setting. It captures the reality of this time in India very beautifully. Now, the name of the poem, it's titled From the Marriage of Heaven and Hell. It's called From the Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And as I'll read the poem, you'll see I found it meaningful because I thought, oh, how wonderful, because India also is that marriage of heaven and hell, heaven being this wonderful constitutional democracy, the world's largest franchise exercising enterprise, married to this time that we're in of fundamentalism, communalism, and muscular violence of the kind that we see, whether it's in Manipur, whether it's in other parts of this country. So from William Blake, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, this is one of the poems that Dr. Ramachandran would have read for his PhD dissertation. And he says this, and the one character that is referenced in this poem is Rintra. Rintra is a prophet from, you know, from the Old Testament, and you'll see that Rintra plays a role in this poem. And this is it from The Marriage of Heaven and Hell by William Blake. Rintra roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air. Hungry clouds swag on the deep. Once meek and in a perilous path, the just man kept his course along. The veil of death, roses are planted where thorns grow, and on the barren heath sing the honeybees. Then the perilous path was planted, and a river and a spring, and on every cliff and tomb, and on the bleached bones, red clay brought forth. Till the villain left the paths of ease to walk in perilous paths and drive, the just man into barren climes. Now the sneaking serpent walks in mild humility, and the just man rages in the wilds where lions roam. Rintra roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air. Hungry clouds swag on the deep. In so many ways, we are that nation of both just and unjust men. We are that nation where the just rage and lions roam, where the sneaking serpent walks in mild humility. We are that nation which will decide now whether we are on a constitutional path or a perilous path. And we are, of course, that country which is also the veil of death, where roses are planted, where thorns grow, and on the barren heath sing the honeybees. We are that nation, that is a constitution's country, a land of honeybees. We are also that nation which seeks and embraces the bloodshed and the disgrace that we have seen unfold in the last few weeks from a, you know, of, of a fellow state, of fellow citizens, and I, I, I think that the images that we have seen um, from Manipur, from other parts of this country, tell you that we are also on a perilous path. So with that in mind, I should go to the subject matter uh, I should go to the subject matter of this talk, which is my constitution's country. And that, of course, for non-lawyers is the constitution. It's the preamble, um, which is this thing. And the way I'm going to do this is um, that I think of, may I go to the second slide? There are 36 slides. So I will say this 35 times. May I go to the second slide, the next slide. So uh, three acts today. Uh, think of this as a play. If, we're going to, if I'm going to tell you a story, then think of it as storytelling and, and playtime. Three acts, the story of modern India's creation, my constitution's country. So uh, creation of constitutional jurisprudence, looking at specific cases, life, liberty, equality, and dignity, and asking this question, is India today her constitution's country? Part one, we'll, we'll, we'll think and talk about how this constitution, which has endured for <coughs> 70 odd years, was made amid a time of great bloodshed, amid a time of partition, 
as refugees flowed into Delhi, the members of the Constituent Assembly acted as parliament by morning and a constituent making body by the afternoon. So they worked very hard, they didn't miss sessions, they debated things, they exchanged papers. My God, what an unfamiliar parliament, right? So we'll talk about that. India's parliament and constituent body worked from 1946, and this is very important, from 1946 to 1949. And why is that interesting? Because the constituent body started functioning before independence. It was meant to be one constituent body for both India and Pakistan. So partition happens, partition is unfolding, the constituent body has already started functioning. So we look at that, and then we look at the, the conditions, the context, the techniques, and how we get here. Right? And I will, of course, end with asking you this question, which is how does our constitution impact each one of us? So, like any play, if you have a play, you have an act. May I go to two slides down? Act one, of course, the creation of modern India. Many of the actors you know, Mr. Nehru, Mr. Gandhi, Dr. Ambedkar, we'll hear some of their voices. Uh, Mr. Jinnah, founder of Pakistan, Lord Mountbatten, uh, the departing British power, members of the Constituent Assembly, watch the set, partition of India, the climax of constitution. The epilogue, we are writing it. So this is the setting. Next slide, please. So in 1947, this is what greeted citizens at that time. And as partition continued to unfold, uh, and uh, for those of us uh, who live in Delhi, uh, most of India is being created, conceived, the partition, uh, the constitution is being written by the constituent assembly. Refugees are flowing in into Purana Kila, which was where refugees would be housed, um, coming into India. So everything is happening in a radius of about five kilometers. And so this is all unfolding in this radius. So in this time where this parliament was sitting and thinking about refugees coming in, rations, displaced house, housing for displaced people. They're also thinking about how do you create this document that will endure for the future. Endurance is a underappreciated virtue. And why is it an underappreciated virtue? Because of the 900 odd constitutions made since Aristotle's time, when he writes the first constitution ever, the 900 odd constitution made, each average, the average length that a constitution will endure is 16 to 18 years. United States, India, exceptions. These are outliers to the norm. Outliers to the norm that constitutions are replaced, created and recreated constantly. 16 to 18 years, we are well over seven decades. For a country as diverse as us, formed out of partition, formed with the kind of bloodshed and displacement that has defined most of North India. This is an extraordinary achievement. Why does that happen? Let's examine it. So this, of course, is the birth of India's freedom, and this is uh, the country's first prime minister. Uh, he's obviously in the news a lot more than he thought he would be 70 years later. Uh, the gentleman spent nine years in prison, mostly on charges of sedition. Um, and this is what he has to say. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. One of the reasons and one of the techniques... A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history. One of the reasons, one of the techniques, an unquantifiable technique, which has contributed much to the constitution enduring, and the successful completion 
of the text of the Constitution in under three years in very difficult conditions is the enormous political goodwill that many of the drafters enjoyed at that time. And that is the remarkable goodwill and legitimacy that drafters like Nehru try to accord to this constitution-making process. And why is legitimacy a concern? Legitimacy is a concern because India and Pakistan's creation is by a British statute, the Indian Independence Act. There were constitutions before that governed the Indian colony that was part of the British Empire. Government of India Act 1919, there was the Government of India Act 1935, and then there was, in 1947, the Independence Act. Now, critics of this constitution and this constitution-making project will tell you that much is drawn from these Government of India Acts. But that is an incomplete telling of the constitution. And it is an incomplete and inaccurate telling of the constitution simply because what is happening as these statutes are being passed by the colonial power is that you have this tremendous resistance that is being put, put on board to, in fact, when the Government of India Act, for instance, is passed, the Congress Party calls it the slave constitution. So you have <laughs> resistance which is being mounted to statutes which are being passed, but resistance on the street, and this is important, resistance on the street, resistance in courtrooms, but also white papers that are constantly being produced within the Congress Party at this time. 1930s onwards, you have this wonderful tradition of white papers that are being produced by the Congress Party saying, these are the problems with these constitutional provisions, these statutory provisions in this Government of India Act 1935. That becomes very important because the tradition of discussion, of critique, of breaking apart legal provisions, constitutional provisions, is in place. And those are the very same techniques that are drawn on when the Constituent Assembly comes to be. So therefore, there are many theories as to why we wrote a successful constitution. And I will talk to you about four of them um, and, and the people who, who put it together. Now, next. Now, this picture, I just love it. I have no good explanation for it. What I love about this picture is you'll see this abject enjoyment, this laughter, smiling. Both gentlemen spent a fair number of years experiencing British hospitality and, and prisons and so on and so forth. They, you know, participate in people's movements. They're just there. And yet, I have seen numerous pictures of many of these gentlemen smiling. And it tells me something that's very important, especially in times such as these which are so hard, right? For many communities, right? And we are not all the same. I don't believe that. We are not all homogenous. We're all sitting here. We are men and women. We are lower caste and upper caste. We are gay and straight. And we are everything in between. And each of our communities together goes through hard times. And I often think that when we go through these dramatically hard times, I think of instances like this, where these gentlemen could still sit around and clearly just revel in not just each other's company, but also smile. And I think smiling and humor in courtrooms also, Judge, is underrated as, as, a, as a virtue. So this is just a picture I absolutely love. Next slide. Dr. Rajendra Prasad, president of the Constituent Assembly, receiving the draft. Uh, flip side of this picture is Dr. Ambedkar handing it over to him. It's a beautiful picture of him broadly, uh, you know, smiling broadly. Now, there are four techniques attributed as to why India is able to actually successfully write its wonderful constitution. And these four philosophies, if you will, one by Granville Austin, and it's very well known. Everyone's read Red Austin if you're broadly interested in constitutional law. And Granville Austin will tell you it's because, you know, there was consensus. And one party had 80% of the seats, and you had consensus. Guys saw smiling, 
one believed in the constitutional project. Um, Bapu, of course, didn't believe in the constitutional project. He believed in panchayats. He did not subscribe to this project. Um, but that the gentlemen who did subscribe, and the women and the men, and there's a wonderful new book out on the women drafters involved in, if you've read it, uh, uh, in India's constitution making, the same, and I've written a review of that book. It's a wonderful book. So I should say the women and men that they had this remarkable credibility and they were able to deploy it on this project and therefore it worked. People listened to each other and it moved along. Granville Austin's consensus-oriented system. As you know, in India's constitution making project, nobody voted. So unlike, for instance, South Africa, where there was a vote for dissent. So the ANC was overwhelming in its, present, uh, in its presence in parliament, but nonetheless, folks would dissent. We did not have that. We just had articles that would be debated and eventually passed. So according to Granville Austin, it's the consensus-oriented system of this very eminent founding political party that sees it through. Upendra Bakshi um, has a different theory. He says that this is a disciplined and hierarchical process that the Congress adopts and therefore, this process is, you know, with whips in place, Patel shepherding along groups, Ambedkar shepherding along other groups, but it is the Congress's hierarchical, hierarchical system that ensures that this project arrives at fruition. The German scholar on India, Dieter Rotman, and more recently Rohit Day, have the most interesting and I believe accurate telling of why we were able to build India's constitution. And they call it, and I'll paraphrase, and the phrase I would use is, it's called resistance constitution. That movements on the street that opposed British laws, that opposed the Government of India Act, that opposed the Government of India Acts 1919, 1935, etc., and this tradition of white paper writing, all of this contributed to resistance to a statute, a new statute being passed. Further resistance to that statute, another statute being passed. So this idea of resistance constitutionalism, people's movements, Congress movements, Congress workers' movements feeding into the constitution that would eventually come to be made, 46 to 49, but the precursors of that were in the 1930s, in the 1920s, and before that. So this is Dieter Rotman's theory, that in fact, this is why the constitution gets made. It's not therefore just in, in my understanding, this three-year project, but it is a 30 to 40-year project that starts unfolding from the early 1900s onwards with this tradition of a political party that has soldiers on the ground, soldiers in jail, people writing white papers, and also exploring intellectually how is it that you conceive of a free, just, and equitable country. And those conversations are had. So the Bill of Rights, fundamental rights as we understand it today, chapter three of the Constitution for lawyers in the audience, as you know, chapter three shows up in one of the early Congress meetings where, you know, in the, in the 30s, resolutions are introduced saying, well, what are the kinds of fundamental rights we would want to have? And you'll see early imprints of this in the 1930s uh, onward. And of course, the fourth theory. The Israeli constitutional scholar Hannah Lerner tells us that one of the reasons why it worked is incrementalism. That whatever the Constituent Assembly did, they did in an incremental fashion. Uniform Civil Code, put it in the Directive Principles of State Policy. Let's not vote on it now. Let's stick it in there. Let's say it's an aim, an objective, and an ideal to be achieved, but we will get to it slowly. Right? So incrementalism. And of course, this idea of what is a national language. You have a national language, you have an official language, incrementally putting it there. Not sort of thrusting it down your neck, unlike, well, anyway. Uh, uh, next slide. This, of course, is very glum, gentle. Lord Mountbatten, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and Jawaharlal Nehru. This is the signing of uh, rains are also upon us. This is the signing of partition era documents. You can see 
um, this is a, a stressful time. You can see that this is a stressful time. I think maybe you might need to increase the mic a little bit because of the rain. Sorry? Yeah, volume needs to go up because of the rain, I think. Yeah. Uh, so if I could get a little more power on the mic as well. So of course, looking very distressed here because as scholars like Aisha Jalal will teach us, will tell us that everything had to be divided. Soldiers had to be divided. Books have to be divided. Land has to be divided. This is the reality of partition. Next slide. And this is what greeted us. And the constituent assembly drafters and members of the assembly, this is what would greet us on both sides of the border, right? Um, so it's not just in India, but also on the other side in Pakistan as trains full of people starting this end and that end would pile into these countries. At this very time that 20 to 30 million people would be displaced and over a million people would be killed, Pakistan was also beginning to write its own constitution and it, and it had its own constituent assembly. From 1947 to 1954, Pakistan would try to unsuccessfully write its first constitution. But that's a different story, and we'll come to that. The next slide. This is Purana Kila that I drive past every day uh, to work. Um, and this is what it looked like in a July in 1946. It looks quite different now, and this was the place where refugees, this is one of the hosting points um, of refugees coming into Delhi. And this is also what was happening between 1946 to 1949. As partition unfolded, as bodies lay in streets, as Bengal would be divided, as Punjab would be divided, as citizens would go across borders, some on foot, some in trains that we saw, some better placed ones in planes. They would leave behind friends and homes and families. As all of this would unfold, these questions of who are we as a country? Why India? What would its values be? Was the conversation that was being had within the constituent assembly. Just like us, they would read about these things in newspapers just like we do today, when we are greeted with bloodshed and violence and dismemberment of fellow citizens, they were also greeted with this on a daily basis on the radio and in newspapers. And what is interesting about these pictures is the repetitive nature of them over the last 75 years. Is the audio OK? Can you hear me over the rain? Is the repetitive nature of these pictures. These are familiar pictures to us as Indians. This is communal violence, where members of different communities on both sides of the border would set upon each other. As this was happening, a question was posed. A question was posed by the colonial constitutionalist scholar Ivor Jennings. And why do I say colonial constitutionalist scholar? Because Jennings, the member of the British Foreign Service, he was stationed in the 40s and 50s in Sri Lanka, and he was trying to get involved in various constitution-making projects in the region. So he visited Pakistan. He contributed greatly in Sri Lanka. Nehru didn't want him in India. But Ivor Jennings asked a question that actually is an important one for anyone interested in constitutionalism in India today. He asked this question, he said, given all of this, why do you not have a provision in your Bill of Rights which actually deals with communal violence? Why do you not have a constitutional provision in the text that actually deals with communal violence? When one ethnicity sets on another, 
or one religious community sets on another, why do you not have a constitutional classification that captures that? And perhaps, I would argue, foist responsibility. It was believed at that time that individual rights as are protected by chapter three would be the answer. That a provision which says right to equality and we look at that would be good enough. That a provision that says no non-discrimination on grounds of religion or race or gender would be good enough. That individual rights would be enough to deal with this. Now, before I express my thoughts, I want you to dwell on that. Have chapter three, part three rights, is it sufficient for the times we live in today? Or this idea of Jennings, to have a classification that captures communal violence in the constitutional text, would that have been a preferred mode? I'm going to leave that thought with you and we'll come back to it shortly. And this is of course, arguably the founders of both nations, Jinnah and Gandhi. And the reason why I have this picture here is that they both die a few months of the founding of both nations and they both die a few months with, you know, before and after each other. Jinnah dies of tuberculosis and Gandhi of course is killed by a hateful assassin. And so both countries lose their founders shortly after independence. One country is able to recover from that, get its constitution done, and one country never recovers from that loss. And arguably, Pakistan's constitution-making project would have looked very different if Jinnah had stayed in power. But this other country, India, that is being created at this time, and these questions of values that are being debated within the Constituent Assembly, this decision not to be a Hindu India, this decision to be a secular country, and the word secularism may well have been added to the preamble 30 years later, but the conception of secularism is writ large in every conversation that is being had in the Constituent Assembly from 46 to 49, or arguably in the, in, in the 30, 40 years before. But the point simply is, is that because this wasn't a one-person project, because this was a larger-than-life project that endured over 30, 40 years, those values could be easily captured in part three and part four of the Constitution of India, and arguably that is what has contributed to the endurance of this Constitution. This is Nehru addressing the Constituent Assembly so the Constituent Assembly of India, which started out, which should have been a 296 member body. The first session had 210 members who attended, 70 members of the Muslim League boycotted the Constituent Assembly, 155 members were Hindus, 20 scheduled castes, five Sikhs, five Christians, five from backward tribes, three Anglo-Indians, three Parsis, four Muslims. So, Interestingly, not much diversity. So a pretty homogeneous body, but a pretty homogeneous body making a constitution that would capture and protect this country's diversity. So it is not simply who is in decision making. It is also about what is the vision you have for the society that you want. Right? So the constitution is not just about when you can impose emergency. A constitution is not just about schedules to the constitution, which says whether the state or the center or the concurrent list has legislative powers, but the constitution is also a manifesto right, for a more decent country, for a people with paternity and dignity and a society that says we want to be better than what we were. Right? So we are also a society that is, has been for a long time, much longer than any constitution will endure, been defined by caste, been defined by gender inequality, been defined by all kinds of uh, discrimination and degradation. And here is this constitution, ahead of its time, 
that says, you know, it's not enough to just have individual rights. It's not just enough to have formal equality, and we'll come to the equality clause. But these framers sit down and have a, con a conversation on how do we make reparations for caste? We'll have provisions for scheduled caste rights in the Constitution. That is, that is a radical idea ahead of its time. Imagine coming to these conclusions in the 1940s. Today, America is having a conversation after so many years of slavery and so many years of a constitution and so many years of amendments to the constitution that speak to equality. Today, America is having a tentative conversation on reparation. And you still have a Supreme Court that will not let affirmative action exist. So this is truly a constituent body that was far ahead of its time and recognizes the need for reparation. So this is Ambedkar confronted one day in the, in, in the 1940s with the fact that 70 members of the Muslim League have boycotted the assembly. And a question is posed to members of the assembly and to him saying, well, what do we do? How do we take people along if you have a large chunk of members of the assembly of one faith not here? How is it that we're going to take people along? And this is what he says. Mr. Chairman, therefore, I should have thought that in order to make a start, in order to induce every party, every section in this country, it would be the act of greatest statesmanship for the majority party even to make a concession to the prejudices of people who are not prepared to march together. And it is for that that I propose to make this appeal. Let us leave aside slogans. Let us leave aside words which frighten people. Let us even make concession to the prejudices of our opponents. Bring them in so that they may So Ambedkar's methodology amid the din that is this rain, his methodology was very clear, right? No slogans, no rhetoric. It's not just about whether it's legal or illegal. That this is something more than that. How is it that you draw them in? You make some concessions, but you keep the tone and tenor of this lawmaking project reasonable, civil, based on reason. And I think it's a very important message that was sent out, that this homogenous body, despite the boycott of 70 members, this homogenous body would make a constitution for all Indians. And I think that is a key factor that, apart from the enormous political goodwill, that is a key factor as to why this constitution endures. Because it has something for every minority. And it has something for all those minorities which are put together that then become a majority in this country. Right? That this is a manifesto for you as well that we make promises to you, and you, and you, and we intend to keep them. Next slide. And this is the clause, the equality clause, which is Articles 14 and Article 15 of the Constitution, that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or equal protection of the laws within the territory of India that the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, or any of them. That no citizen shall, on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, have any disability with regard to access to, shoe, to shops, public restaurants, hotels, so on and so forth, use of wells. But nothing in this article, or in Clause 2 of Article 29, 
shall prevent the state from making any special provision for the advancement of socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So this is India's composite equality doctrine. Not formal equality, but substantive equality. That you and I, if we are similarly located, will be treated alike. But if you and I are dissimilarly located, say by virtue of caste, then that historical disadvantage will be addressed by special provisions. And this idea that we must make reparations, we must actually have real representation through reparatory moves like this kind of advancement of any socially and educationally backward class of citizens or for scheduled caste or for scheduled tribes. This is what sets apart this constitution making project from any other project anywhere in the world. This idea of substantive equality. And on a side note, if you've not read The Discovery of India, written by Jawaharlal Nehru when he is locked up in yet another, his, his yet another experience of British hospitality, Nehru writes about this idea of substantive equality. And he ends the book with this notion of, well, if you have these problems in this country, and you have people who are so dissimilar because of historical reasons, how do you address them? And he starts thinking about substantive equality, which you'll find in the discovery of India. Article 16, next slide, please. Which is also part of the Equality Code, that there shall be equality of opportunity for all citizens in matters relating to employment or appointment to any office under the state. That no citizen shall, on grounds only of, and you know these markers, religion, race, caste, sex, descent, place of birth, be discriminated. Again, nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any provision for reservation of appointments or posts in favor of any backward class of citizens. And Article 17, untouchability is abolished and its practice in any form is forbidden. The enforcement of any disability arising out of untouchability shall be an offense. So this is what is called the Composite Equality Code of the Constitution. Right? So this is what we've adopted, and this is what comes into play 1950 onwards with some amendments broadly. And you must also know, and I suspect that this has something to do with endurance because endurance of the constitution is something I think about. This is a constitution that has had over a hundred amendments. It is probably one of the most amended documents in the world. And there are two ways of looking at that. Well, aren't you cutting and pasting all kinds of things into the original text? Or you can say no, that amendments do away with the need for mutinies and revolutions that amendments make a document that was made in the 40s enduring and relevant in 2023. So we are also one of the most amended constitutions in the world. Now, finally, modern day India, my constitution's country, uh, I just want to talk about a couple of cases where the laws change, you know, so we are far from a perfect union, but every constitutional litigation, every people's movement is an effort to arrive at a better union, right? So this is broadly a breakdown of population in India by religion. This is based on the 2001 census. There will be a more, more you know, a newer census that will be conducted. You'll see vast numbers vast, vast numbers of, in every religious community. You know, when I look at these numbers, you realize that Europe dwarfs, you know, that, that European constitutionalism and the European Union have far fewer challenges just in terms of number. You know. And I just want to talk very briefly about a couple of cases where, you know, constitutionalism has been pushed. I must confess, I've worked on some of these, on these cases, but I love talking about them uh, in any case, and it's just been a great joy to represent these. So this, of course, is TSR Subramaniam, Chief Secretary at that uh, many years ago of India, and him, along with his merry band of over 100 bureaucrats, 
uh, brought a case to the Supreme Court asking for fixed tenure of IAS and IPS officers because the idea was simply this, that if you give to the political class, the executive, the ability to transfer um, you know, bureaucrats and police officers as punishments, then that's how you take away integrity of those officers. The Supreme Court, after many years, agreed with that because it felt that, you know, that governance, the right to governance is very much, good governance is very much a part of constitutional law. The Right to Education Act, which was passed initially um, as a constitutional amendment, but the Supreme Court has, over 40 years of its jurisprudence, been making an effort to have the right to education a reality. Um, and of course, you know, the act was upheld by the Supreme Court and a Chief Justice, Kapadia, who in fact told opposing counsel that he himself had been to a municipal school in Bombay. He was educated at one such school. What does the Right to Education Act do? Something which is radical, apart from the many things it does. It says that in elite private schools, there will be a set aside, a number of seats set aside for lower income students from those neighborhoods. And this idea that lower income and well-to-do students will hopefully study together, will hopefully have friendships across this class divide and maybe caste divide, and hopefully will grow up together, I think is a wonderful idea because this is fraternity being taught on a daily basis in classrooms to young children. So the Right to Education Act, of course, from the age of six to the age of 14, the conversation now is how do we think about education below the age of six and above the age of 14. So in, in, with its decision, the Supreme Court says that the 2009 Act makes the right to, of children to free and compulsory education justiciable, that every child must have access to a neighborhood school. The 2009 Act was enacted, keeping in mind the crucial role of universal elementary education for strengthening the social fabric of democracy. And uh, next slide. Of course, in case that all of you know well, uh, this is the challenge to Section 377 of the Indian Constitution. Uh, you know, 150-year-old colonial law. You may have heard about it. Um, and I think we took the case to court in 2013 uh, and lost. Uh, it's not a good time for me. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, in 2018, you know, we took the case back to the Supreme Court and won. Now, what is interesting about the case, of course, these are the wonderful clients and petitioners who made that possible. And I have the pictures up because when you think of why do constitutions endure, why do they stay meaningful, it is also because you need people brave enough to go to court. Um, it's as simple as that. And one of the things I think we tried to do with this case is we tried to make queer people not invisible anymore. So how do you make constitutions meaningful? I think, and this is where I will respectfully disagree with the institution of public interest litigation, which I think invisibilizes communities. I think it is very important for uh, marginalized communities to file writ petitions, Article 32, what Ambedkar called the soul of the Constitution, and go to court. This is Ritu Dalmia, petitioner number two, the case against 377, Navdeet Singh Johar, classical Indian dance song, lead petitioner, Sunil Mehra, his partner of 28 years, uh, Aman Nath, petitioner who lost his partner of 32 years, a week before we filed the petition, um, died, his partner died of cancer. And uh, Aisha Kapoor, and of course the Supreme Court said, uh, this is the case we made uh, in our petition that the continuance of section 377 on the statute books in free and independent India makes it all too clear that constitutional guarantees of equality, fraternity, dignity, life, and liberty which are the basis of the constitutional contract on which this country was founded was not extended to the petitioners. Section 377 in particular is a relic of colonial rule and of 19th century Victorian morality. For that, the impugned section violates the fundamental rights of the petitioners under articles 14, 15, 16, 19, um, and 21. Um, and of course, you know, this is a work in progress, continuing project, um, and as
as you know, uh, Supreme Court has seized over matter on marriage equality. But I leave that uh, there. Um, and I want to end with one case before I end this lecture. And you've been a wonderful audience, very patient. It stood me and the rain. Um, is, is, is a case that I find particularly meaningful. It's an ongoing case, so I'll just give you a description. Leave it there. And this is a case that concerns the state of money, uh, which has been in the news. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a very brief description. I am a micus to the Supreme Court in that it concerns alleged uh, allegation killing, one five two eight killings of uh, Manipuri citizens. Uh, and it's an interesting case because in Manipur, I'm not sure if many of you know, but the Armed Forces Special Powers Act has been in place since 1958. Uh, so when we think of, you know, uh, who is free from 1947 onwards, 1962, when the Constitution was adopted, I leave you with one other thought: that freedom is not an equal freedom for all communities, in and that while many of us enjoy. Uh, our freedom, whether it's in 47 or 50 or 2018 or what have you, there are many others who don't. Uh, part of the legacy of colonialism is the willingness of governments in independent India to continue colonial um, uh, statutes in play, including the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. The reason why I'm saying this is that when we reflect on violence and communalism and what we see as it unfolds today. Please understand that these things don't happen in a day or a minute. These are enduring legacies that like the Constitution has endured. These legacies of violence culminate in what we're seeing because they've been put in place for many, many decades. So this is um, the uh, state of Manipur. You'll see it's, it's, it's you know, uh, folks in the Northeast will tell you that uh, their news fairly makes it to mainland Indian newspapers and TV channels, and it's something we are realizing today. Um, uh, these are graves, Manipur, and this idea of unknown graves and unknown bodies. Manipuri mothers don't claim the bodies of their children in recent time uh, because of just the number of killings that were happening, uh, you know, in the early 2000s and 2015, 2016. I will not take my son's body or my daughter's body back till you let me uh, what happened, until I have some kind of account. Um, of course, the legal issues and cases like this, where you have the Army Act, you have the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, the Penal Code and the Code of Procedure, two, three or four colonial legacies. The fourth one, marginally improved. So when we think of constitutionalism and we think of freedom, we also have to think of law reform and a reform of the colonial project that is many of our laws and many of the assumptions on how the Indian state governs. That is something that has to be reformed. And I want to end with this, uh, you know, sort of what Justice Lokur sitting then on the bench hearing this case said, about truth, uh, because I think in these times where truth can be manufactured and a lot of problem with truth telling, I just wanted to leave this with you. And he said this, it is necessary to know the truth so that the law is tempered with justice. The exercise for knowing the truth mandates ascertaining whether fake encounters or extrajudicial executions have taken place. And if so, who are the perpetrators of human rights violations? And how can the next of kin be commiserated with and what further steps ought to be taken, if any. But his line that it is necessary to know the truth so that the law is tempered with justice, I think is a good philosophy uh, for all of us to find, whether you are a journalist um, or a lawyer uh, or a professional of any sort, um, that we have to recommit ourselves in this country to the project of just truth and honesty. Uh, why is what is happening? that is today. It is surely not violence of this kind. It's surely not something that explodes in a day or a month uh, or even a year. Um, and this, of course, is Justice Lokur continuing uh, in that case. 
and this is Manipur over the last week. Uh, I think, you know, classic case of inter-ethnic communal violence. Uh, and, and, and really, I think the news and videos capture enough that it doesn't really need to be belabored. So I'll end with this, but leave you with this. That I wonder if, I wonder what the framers of India's constitution would say to us as a country in 2023 when they were confronted with any newspaper that you may open today, whether it's violence in Manipur, or whether it is the kind of abject apathy that seems to define you know, the functioning of the Indian state. Now, what would they say? You cannot have a constitutional vision and its reality being abject neglect of citizens and fueling of violence. I think nation states break down and social fabrics break down. Fraternity as a project collapses when you have this kind of fueling. So it brings me back to where I started, William Blake's poem on the marriage of heaven and hell. Because I think if you care about what is happening to fellow citizens, then you will recognize that India today is a marriage of heaven and hell. And the question that remains for each one of us, in whatever capacity, that we navigate and negotiate each other, the Indian state, the jobs we do, the functions we perform, is that how do we move a little more towards that heaven that the Constitution's idea of India is and move away from the hell that is the reality of that Constitution. So stop with that. I want to thank you very, very much for spending this hour with me. Thank you, Dr. Goswami, and thank you all of you for your time and patience. Thank you. <laughs>